Okay, so now we are on record. Uh, let me start by stopping the transcription. And before I proceed, I would like to know if I'm audible. So um, are you guys hearing me? Yes, sir. <clears throat> oh, that's fine. So today we are we are looking at inductive reasoning. And I hope uh, I hope you guys can also see the slides. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yes, we got you. So inductive reasoning. Um, last week we saw deductive reasoning, and we saw that deductive reasoning is the instance where the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical. And we saw that deductive reasoning is like mathematics in the sense that it's just all about the, the structure and the relationship between the parts. You know. and, and in fact, the meanings of the contents do not matter. What just matters is the relationship between one part of the argument and another. But for inductive reasoning, the relationship is not logical. Now, where the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not logical, in that case, it becomes important to look at the meanings of the contents of the sentences. It's no more like deductive reasoning where it's it's a it's a question of manipulation, you know, mathematical manipulation. For of course you can see that for deductive reasoning, it's a matter of you know just mathematical deductions. Now for inductive reasoning, the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not logical, and it is possible to affirm all the premises and deny the conclusion without running into contradiction. And that's because the premises are capable of producing more than one conclusion. You know. And in cases where premises are capable of producing more than one conclusion, in that case, you need to look at the meanings of the content and then use your common sense. You know. So there, you are left alone with your common sense. So we're going to see how that... Um, works. Uh, let me take a call and then we proceed. Okay, so sorry for that interruption. Now, for inductive arguments, uh, this, this distinction is very important. Premises provide reason for believing in the likelihood of the conclusion. Premises provide reason for believing in the likelihood of the 
conclusion. But premises don't guarantee the conclusion. You see, the premises can help you, you know, they can be suggestive of, you know, to what extent the conclusion might be true. But they don't guarantee the truth of the conclusion. And so inductive arguments are somewhat like probability arguments. You know, they are somewhat like probability arguments because inductive arguments do not depend on rules. They are harder to evaluate. Now, evaluating inductive arguments is not like evaluating deductive arguments. But of course, you saw that when we are evaluating deductive arguments, all you need to do when you're evaluating a deductive argument is to ask yourself, is this an argument that um, affirms the antecedent or denies the antecedent? Or does it affirm or deny the consequent? That's all. Or is it a hypothetical argument or a disjunctive argument? Those are the questions, the only questions you need to ask yourself in evaluating a deductive argument. But for inductive arguments, it's no longer about the logical relationship. It's about the likelihood of the conclusion. It's in the realm of probability. So what you are doing, when you are dealing with probability, the best thing you do is what? You just look at the content, the meaning of the content of the argument, the meaning of the content. That's what you'll be looking at. And then you decide, based on your real life experiences outside the argument, whether to accept it or not. And so when you are evaluating inductive arguments, you are not looking at the logical relationship. You are just looking at, since you know it's a matter of probability and that uh, the conclusion might not be a correct one, there is more than one possible conclusion. Then when you're making uh, probability calculations, those calculations will be based on your, you know, your own uh, personal analysis of what the argument is talking about, the topic, the meaning of the content of the argument, and then your own experiences. So that's what, what you'll be doing. In that case, you are falling back to instruments or methods that uh, can help you when uh, pure logic cannot. Okay, so inductive arguments. Uh, by now you know that my, my own definition of inductive arguments, which is not in your textbook, is that there are arguments that are saddled with more than one possible conclusion because premises support but do not guarantee the stated conclusion. So that's my summary of inductive arguments. They are arguments that give you the possibility of more than one possible conclusion. And for me, that's the major way of knowing if an argument is inductive. Now we have, uh, you know, seen the definition, the summary definition of inductive arguments. We have to uh, be begin to study inductive arguments. Now, to start with inductive arguments, we need to make a few clarifications. The first clarification is about the difference between verifiable and confirmable statements. Verifiable statements are statements we can directly test or verify. They are usually factual or empirical statements. You know, example, Kofi loves strength with age. You know, statements you can directly verify. Kofi lost strength with age. They are usually factual or empirical statements. Now, confirmable statements are statements we cannot test or verify directly, except through verifiable statements. You know, so. For instance, all men lose strength with age. All men lose strength with age. You can't directly verify it except through a verifiable statement, such as Kofi lost strength with age. So it's important for you to understand this distinction between these two kinds of statements. Verifiable statements, 
you can verify them directly. Confirmable statements, you can't verify them directly, except by, you know, analyzing verifiable statements. And in this instance, you can see that Kofi lost strength with age. It can go a long way, or well, we don't, we don't know if it's a long way, but it can help you somehow to decide whether to believe that all men lose strength with age. Right? You can't analyze all men lose strength with, with age. You, there's no way to analyze that, except, except to you know, begin by analyzing one man, this man, that man. And that's why you have to start with the verifiable statement, Kofi lost strength with age. If you study Kofi's strength, you study someone else's strength. You, you, you study James, you also study Peter. You know, you study man by man, just like that, from one man to the other. And then you begin to get ideas about whether all men lose strength with age. That's the importance of the distinction between uh, verifiable and confirmable statements. Now let's combine the two kinds of statements. When you look at an inductive argument, the conclusion is usually a confirmable statement, and then the, the premises are all verifiable statements. So here you can see four verifiable statements as premises, and then the conclusion is a confirmable statement. That's the typical nature of uh, inductive arguments. Kofi lost strength with age, Peter lost strength with age, Michael lost strength with age, James lost strength with age. Therefore, all men lose strength Alex, with age. So technically speaking, a couple of uh, verifiable statements uh, you know, would lead to a conclusion that it's a confirmable statement. So the premises are verifiable statements leading to the conclusion unverifiable or confirmable statement. Another example, Mary reached menopause as four, by 40. Grace reached menopause by 35. Meredith reached menopause by 33. Rose reached menopause by 34. Eddie reached menopause by 38. Sophia reached menopause by 45. Therefore, half of all women reach menopause by 35. Now, these are six verifiable statements. Six verifiable statements as premises. In, in three of them, three of them are telling you about women who reach menopause before 35 or at 35. And then three others are telling you about women who reach menopause after 35. And also it's 50-50. It's, it's three women here reach menopause by 35 and the other three reach menopause after 35. And the conclusion is that half of all women which menopause by 35. Now, so this, this is the kind of argument you get in a typical scientific study. So already you begin to get the idea that inductive argument or inductive reasoning is the, is the main reasoning of the sciences. Inductive reasoning is the reasoning by which the sciences conduct experiments in order to reach conclusions. Now you can see that by the nature of this argument, it cannot be a 100% accurate argument. And that's why we call it inductive. But mo a lot of times it leads to correct conclusions. Uh, give me a minute.
Okay, so some renovation work is going on around here. And uh, it's causing a bit of noise. Well, I think we can we can we can just uh, cope with the noise. So as you can see from this example, free premises are suggesting that women reach menopause before 35. And three other premises is suggesting women reach menopause after 35. And that tells you why the conclusion is the way it is. Therefore, half of all women wish menopause by 35. And so I was saying that this is the typical example of an inductive argument, which, which is common in, in the sciences. Now let's look at two ways of detecting confirmable statements. And so the question is, how, how do you detect confirmable statements? Now, so there are two things to note about confirmable statements. First of all, confirmable statements are not directly testable or verifiable. So that one we already know. But secondly, is that they can be converted into conditional statements. So, these are two points to note. Convertible statements are not directly testable. And secondly, they can be converted into conditional statements. Now, let's look at this example. Categorical statement. No leader steps down from power unless compared by a coup or constitution. No leader steps down from power unless compared by a coup or constitution. Now, convert it to a conditional. If X is a leader, then X will not step down unless compared by a coup or constitution. Now, it is only confirmable statements that you can convert into conditional statements. And I think this, this, this helps us with the general issue of conditional statements. You know, when we were discussing deductive reasoning, I was saying that there are certain statements you, you cannot convert into conditionals. It is here that you see that very clearly. Now you cannot convert you cannot convert verifiable statements into conditional statements. You cannot convert verifiable statements into uh, conditionals. It's only confirmable statements that you can convert into conditionals. So I would like you to you know do some bit of homework with that. You, you can practice it, do some exercises. Try and convert a verifiable statement into a conditional statement, and you see it's not possible. But you can convert a confirmable statement into a conditional statement. So that's a very uh, important point to note. So this is what I was talking about. A statement that is directly verifiable or testable can't be converted into a conditional statement. Uh, for example, if he lost 28, uh, a minute.
Okay, so let's find out if you can convert a, a directly uh, testable statement into a conditional. Kofi lost strength with age. Would you say if a man is called Kofi, then such a man lost strength with age? That would mean that all men called Kofi are old, and there are no children or young women or young people called Kofi. Or there are no strong young people called Kofi. Now, so, if you try to convert a verifiable statement into a conditional, you are automatically trying to convert it into a confirmable statement. Because when you say, if Kofi, if someone is called Kofi, then he will lose strength with age. What it means is that if anyone at all who is called Kofi will lose strength with age, which is not true. Uh, it's it's not true to the original statement. The original statement is referring to a certain person, a particular person called Kofi. So the statement Kofi lost strength with age is specific. It's referring to someone, not all men. And so you can convert it into a conditional statement because that will convert it into a confirmable statement as well that refers to all Kufis, that would be clearly wrong. Okay, so the summary is that you can only convert confirmable statements to conditional statements, but you can't convert verifiable statements to conditional statements. Okay, let's look at another distinction between finite and infinite reference classes, which we saw last week. We already know that finite refers to countable. Examples, this copper, that man, some boys, that table. And infinite refers to the uncountable items, all metals, all men, all refers. Now, that distinction is important in classifying hypotheses into types. Now we have law-like and statistical hypothesis. Now, it's important to know that um, confirmable statements are also technically hypotheses. Now, law-like hypotheses are confirmable statements that refer to all members of the class. Law-like hypothesis are confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. And so that tells us that, first of all, hypotheses are confirmable statements. Example, all metals ex expand when heated. All metals expand when heated. So we are told that law-like hypotheses are confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. Um, so all members of a class all metals expand when heated. That's a law-like hypothesis because it refers to all me members of a class. In this case, all metals. Mm -hmm. Now, convert it to a conditional. If X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. Now, when you are... <laughs> now, when you are converting... When you are converting law-like hypotheses, when you are converting law-like hypotheses to conditionals, it helps you to see that the, the conditional is like what I would call a perfect conditional. If X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. If something is a metal, it will expand when heated because we are told that all metals expand when heated. That's the implication. You know, that's why it is called law-like hypothesis. The law-like is because anything that's a metal will expand. It's like a law. That law is produced by the reference class all, the infinite reference class. So if you are using the infinite reference class all metals, expand when heated, then somehow you, you are creating a law 
for any matter. Because what you are saying that if something is a matter, then this is what will happen. So law-like hypothesis is a kind of hypothesis when you get, when you make a hypothesis about all members or no members of the class. When you make a hypothesis with infinite reference class. Another example, all Fs are Gs. That means each F is a G. No Fs are Gs. It means all Fs are not Gs. Now, law-like is highly predictive. That's why we call it law-like. G must be attributed or non-attributed to every F. All men are mortal. If Peter is a man, then Peter is mortal. It's simple. When you use the, the, the terminology all, that's, that's, what, that's what it implies. Now, anything that's a man is very predictably mortal. So that's why we say that law-like is a highly predictive terminology or a highly predictive category of terms to use. Then we go to statistical hypothesis. Now, the statistical hypothesis are confirmable statements referring to some percentage less than 100 and more than zero. Confirmable statements. Statistical hypothesis are confirmable statements referring to some percentage less than 100% and more than zero, zero percent. That's why we call it statistical hypothesis. Example, 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. So statistical terms include some, few, many, most, hardly any, typically. Now, confirmable, uh, confirmable hypotheses are less predictive. They are less predictive. If X ate the food, X is likely to fall sick. Now, so when you say that 90% of those who ate the food fell sick, what you're saying is that if X ate the food, X is likely. Now, we're using likely because we don't know if X is among the 90% of those who fell sick or the 10% who did not fall sick. So that's why we see that uh, statistical hypothesis are less predictive compared to the law-like hypothesis. Now, inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. They are aimed at confirmation. Deductive arguments are aimed at proof. Now, confirmation is not proof. Now, so, so the, way, the way confirmation is used there, it is used in, in a sense that makes it weaker compared to proof. And that's why they are saying confirmation is not proof. Now, this book was written by Helen Lauer, Professor Helen Lauer, the book you are using. But in the critical thinking uh, book I wrote with some other authors, we didn't we didn't use confirmation. Instead of confirmation, we say support. You know that um, inductive arguments are aimed at supporting uh, their conclusions. So we say rather that support is not proof. You know now evidence confirms, but does not prove the truth of a hypothesis. You know, so evidence has a limitation, which we are going to see right now. So let's look at that. Now, there are two major ways to detect inductive arguments. Two major ways to detect inductive arguments. First of all, inductive arguments are capable of more, more than one conclusion. So premise one, 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. Premise two, Amma ate the food. Conclusion, Amma fell sick. Amma did not fall sick. Two conclusions are possible, and both conclusions are legitimate. They are equally legitimate. Now, the second way of detecting inductive arguments is that inductive arguments are extrapolations. They are strictly extrapolations. Now, Extrapolation is an activity that smuggles in information into the conclusion that is absent in any of the premises. An extrapolation is an activity that smuggles in information into the conclusion that is absent in any of the premises. So all inductive conclusions contain information that is not accounted in the premises. Now we will see how that works. 
Now let's look at the technicality of induction. Now, a known thing, A, has certain properties, such as X, Y, and Z. A known thing, A, has certain properties, such as X, Y, and Z. Another thing, B, that is not in the premises, has the same properties, X, Y, and Z. Now, so A has X, Y, and Z. B has X, Y, and Z. Now, A also has some additional property, which is Q. Now, inductive argument is that on the basis of the above three premises, the argument concludes, in reality, extrapolates that B also has the additional property Q. Now, so if you're saying that A has X, Y, and Z, and B has X, Y, and Z, and then maybe as time goes on, we discover that A also has Q. Deductive argument will tell you that, yes, B would have Q. But we are not sure. That's why we call it inductive argument. That's why we say inductive argument is really an extrapolation. It's not a certain argument. It is not telling you that B has Q because it is sure, you know. So that's why we say that inductive arguments are strictly not valid arguments. They are extrapolations, and um, the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not always logical. Now let's let's move on. The idea of induction then is that if B is like A in some respects, then B may also be like A in other respects. So that's the crux, the crux of the matter in induction. If B is like A in some respect, it may also be like A in other respects. Now, there are different directions of extrapolation. Now, all these, these ones are, all these are not in your textbook, but I'm bringing them in so that you understand the topic much more thoroughly. Now, so if you want all these explanations, you can uh, go go for the critical thinking uh, book at the, uh, at the bookshop, at the Kingdom Bookshop. All right. So, part whole extrapolations. Let's look at the different directions of extrapolation. You have part whole extrapolations. Attributing something to a whole that constitutes a part or parts. Attributing something to a whole that constitutes a part or parts. Now, we have two types of part-whole extra extrapolations. We have generalizations and statistical syllogisms. Now, generalization is when you, you know, when you make a general conclusion from premises talking about particular things. Generalization. Peter is strong, James is strong, all men are strong. Peter is strong, James is strong, all men are strong. That's a generalization. Then you have statistical syllogisms. Most Canadian university students drink alcohol. Caroline is a Canadian university student, therefore Caroline drinks alcohol. So that this, this one is a statistical syllogism. Okay. Then we have analogies. Analogy is arguing that something possesses the same thing as another because they both possess some other properties. Arguing that something possesses the same thing as another because they both possess some other properties. Okay. Now let's look at this example. The structural adjustment program was good for Cameroon, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Uganda, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Senegal, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Nigeria, which is a third world country. Therefore, the structural adjustment program must be good for Togo, which is a third world country. Now, so the premises are talking about how the structural adjustment program fared in about four third world countries. And on the basis of that, the conclusion decides that it would be good for yet another third world country. So that's an argument by analogy. That's what we call an analogy. 
because it worked here, we decide that uh, we conclude that it will work here. Okay. Predictions. Predictions attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of frequency of past occurrences of the same quality in similar events. Attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of frequency of past occurrences of the same quality in similar events. Example, Tyson has won his last 30 boxing fights. Conclusion, Tyson will win his next boxing fight. So that's a prediction. The conclusion is somehow a projection of the past. And of, of course, you can see why this is not a valid argument. Because Tyson could, could lose his next boxing fight. Now, so those are the directions of extrapolation. You have part whole extrapolations, you have analogies, and you have predictions. Now, let's look at two kinds of enumerative inductive arguments based on strength. Two kinds of enumerative inductive arguments based on strength. Now, enumerative argument is argument with many premises. An argument that has many premises is called an enumerative argument because you are somewhat enumerating the premises like a list. Now, let's look at the first kind, arguments with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. Now, so we're looking at 10 premises a summary premise, and then a conclusion. So this is a long argument. That's why it's, it's called an enumerative argument. Premise one, gold expanded when heated. Sil two, silver expanded when heated. Bronze expanded when heated. Copper expanded, aluminum expanded, platinum expanded, brass expanded. Lead expanded, iron expanded, zinc expanded. So 10 premises are talking about 10 types of metals that expanded when heated. And then the summary premise is that all metals, all the metals tested so far. Now note that it is referring to all the metals, all the metals, which is uh, a finite reference class a class of countable items. All the metals tested so far expanded when heated. And then a conclusion is that all metals, all metals expand when heated. Now, I want you to look carefully at the difference between the summary premise and the conclusion. What's the major difference? What's the clearest difference to you between the summary premise and the conclusion? Is there someone who has an idea? What is the clearest difference between the summary premise and the conclusion? Okay, so uh, David Frimpong, you are raising your hand. So can you unmute yourself so that you can uh, discuss the, the difference? Okay. So with the summary premise, it has a, a finite reference class. That's all the metals tested. Then with the conclusion, the reference class is infinite. Okay, so that's a very good, that's a very good uh, suggestion. So the reference classes, the reference classes are not the same. And because they are not the same, that has some implications. Now, if you are saying that all the metals tested expanded when heated, and then on that basis, you conclude that all metals expand when heated, what is the possible, what, what is the possible risk you are taking with such a conclusion based on such a premise? 
what risks are you taking by making such a general conclusion based on a particular observation? So are you taking when you make such a wide ranging and general and somewhat infinite, uh, infinite conclusion based on uh, observations that are precise, countable, and limited? So that's the risk of um, using reaching conclusions that are, you know, law-like, uh, or you know, conclusions with infinite reference classes. When you jump, when you reach the conclusion that all metals expand when heated, based on an observation that some metals tested expand when heated. Is, then it means you are somewhat jumping. You are somewhat jumping from particular to general, from particular to general. So there's a risk involved in that jump. You know. The risk is that, you know, when you're talking about the general, all metals, all metals is a category that has information that the particular does not have. There is a, there, there are, there are, there are, there's, a, there's something about all metals. There's an information about all metals that you don't have when you are dealing with some metals. And that was, that's why we say that in an inductive argument, you will notice that the conclusion has smuggled in some information that is absent in the premises. The information in some metals, in the experiment about some metals, cannot satisfy the information required in dealing with all metals. So reaching a conclusion about all metals is to reach a conclusion about information that you did not get from analyzing some metals. So that means that information was smuggled in into the conclusion that is absent in the premises. That's another major way of detecting an inductive argument. And in the case of reaching a law-like hypothesis, that problem becomes uh, very huge. The problem reaches its height when you reach law-like uh, hypotheses as conclusions. When you make conclusions that are technically law-like hypotheses, when you make a law-like hypothesis, you are professing to know about all metal, uh, all items in a class. You are professing to know about all items in the class, even when the items are uncountable. So that's a huge risk. Now, the technicality, premises 1 to 10 are verifiable or particular statements. Summary premise is summation of all your verifiable statements. Conclusion is a confirmable or general statement. Argument strictly is invalid because it involves jumping from verifiable to confirmable statements. And that's the reason why confirmation is not proof and inductive arguments are not valid. Now, in fact, as a matter of fact, the conclusion is false. There are some metals that in fact do not expand when heated. They are called superconductors. They don't absorb heat. And because they don't absorb heat, therefore they do not expand. 
So the conclusion is in fact false and all the premises are true. So in this case, you see that the, from this argument, all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. And so it, it is possible to deny conclusion with all true premises or affirm premises and deny conclusion. That's why we say that in an inductive argument, the premises could be true and the conclusion could be false without any contradiction, without any contradiction. Now, so this, this is applicable to all the types of extrapolation, pathole, analogies, predictions. You can perfectly say that Tyson won his last 30 box, boxing fight, but he did not win his next boxing fight. Yeah. Now, having seen the danger of reaching conclusions that are law-like, based on information you got from, you know, certain particular experiments. Let's now look at some of the some of the differences between deductive and inductive arguments. Now, usually when something is an advantage of deductive arguments, it, it becomes a disadvantage of inductive arguments. And if something is a disadvantage of deductive arguments, it becomes an advantage of, the, of inductive arguments. Now let's begin here. Deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the inability to provide information. You know, so deductive arguments are accurate, but they are not good in providing information. Now look at these examples. Either it is raining or it is not raining, which is a disjunctive syllogism. Now, the question you would ask yourself, does this statement tell you whether it is raining? It doesn't. Either it is raining or it is not raining. When you see that statement, you have not uh, found out if it will rain or not. You still need to look for information about whether it is going to rain. Now, number two, second example, if it is raining, then someone will get wet. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. Does this statement tell you whether it is raining? No, it doesn't. It just tells you that if it does so, then this is what will happen to someone. Now, can you fault these statements? No. You can't really fault these statements because they are true. They are 100% true. But the reason why they are 100% true is also the reason why they, don't, they are not providing you with any information about about the weather. Now, inductive arguments provide information, on the other hand, at the expense of accuracy. Inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. So that means that if you, if you aim at full accuracy, you wouldn't be able to provide information. But if you aim at information provision, then you will be suffering in terms of accuracy. You, you, you have to sacrifice something about accuracy. Now, when you are providing information, you are providing something that is falsifiable. Providing information is to be falsifiable. Example, it is raining right now. When you say it is raining right now, that information is falsifiable. You can fault it, you can refute it, you, you can prove it to be false. If you say it is raining right now and it is not raining right now, then that statement has been falsified. You know, so it's an empirical statement, a factual statement. And that's why I would say it can be falsified. 
any factual statement can be falsified if the facts are contrary. Now, falsifiability and science. Any valuable empirical information must be falsifiable. There is no empirical information that is not falsifiable. Any statement that is not falsifiable cannot be a verifiable or confirmable statement. And any statement that is absolutely true, absolutely true, has no empirical content. Any statement that is absolutely true has no empirical content. So I think you should note that because it's very important. Now, more valuable but more falsifiable. Now, the more valuable an empirical statement, the more falsifiable it is. The more valuable an empirical statement in terms of how much it tells you about the actual world, the more falsifiable it will be. Now, the empirical statement, it rains every third Friday of the month. It rains every third Friday of the month. It's more valuable information than it rained just now. It rains every third Friday of the month. We'll, we'll give you more information compared to it rained just now. Now, if it is raining just now, you, you can only it can only help you to do certain things that you know that last during the duration of the rain. But if you get information that it rains every third Friday of the month, it will help you to, you know, to do to it, it will affect much more things that you do. You could decide that every third Friday of the month you wouldn't go to certain places. Every third Friday of the month you could, you know, or every third uh, Thursday of the month. A day before every third Friday of the month, you will go farming so that the next day the farm would be uh, watered by the rain. So the information it rains every third Friday of the month is actually more valuable compared to the information it rained just now. There is only limited things you can do with the information it rained just now. So the more valuable, the, the more falsifiable. Now, it will take only one fourth Friday of not raining to falsify the first statement that it rains every third Friday of the month. So the more valuable an information, the more falsifiable, you know. Now, let's look at the second type of inductive argument, the second type of inductive argument. Arguments with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. Now, so we have finished looking at arguments with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. And we saw that in those arguments, there is a jump from particular statements as premises to general statements as conclusions. And then we discussed the risks involved in that jump. And we saw that that jump is uh, not very good. Now let's look at this statistical argument or argument with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. Michael was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Gilbert was vaccinated for polio and suffered polio. Mary was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Stanley was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. James was vaccinated and never suffered. Bob was vaccinated and suffered. Jill was vaccinated and never suffered. Samuel was vaccinated and never suffered. John was vaccinated and never suffered. Carol was vaccinated and never suffered. Summary premise, eight out of 10 people who were vaccinated did not suffer polio. So eight out of 10 people did not suffer polio. Conclusion. Polio vaccination has 80% potential of um, preventing polio. Now, if the vaccination could prevent 8 out of 10 people from suffering polio, then the conclusion is that 
uh, the vaccination has 80%, 80% potential of preventing polio. So that's a typical, that's a, a typical statistical argument or a typical argument with a statistical hypothesis as conclusion. Now, when you have a conclusion that this is statistical hypothesis, you see that the conclusion is paying more attention, paying more attention to what the premises are saying. Instead of just making a general conclusion that all metals expand when heated, the conclusion is paying a close attention to what the premises are doing. Now you can see that statistical arguments are actually safer and more prudent compared to arguments with law-like statements as uh, conclusions or hypotheses. Uh, so it is safer to make statistical arguments compared to law-like arguments. Making law-like arguments based on uh, experiments with particular samples it, it involves a huge risk because at the end of the day, there might be no law when you say there's a law. Now, so the two types of inductive arguments are the ones ending with law-like hypotheses as conclusions and the ones ending with statistical hypotheses as conclusions. Now, hypotheses are technically regarded as conclusions of inductive arguments. Hypotheses are technically regarded as conclusions of inductive arguments because they are confirmable statements to be supported, confirmed or denied by verifiable statements. So that's the end of the class. Next week, we shall be discussing causal reasoning. And at this point, I would um, uh, pause a little for anyone who has questions. Uh, so as you can see, some maintenance work is going on around my around my block and uh, I'll quickly take any questions. If there are none, then I would uh, end the class and uh, stop the recording and begin uploading the class, the yeah, recorded session. Julius, Julius, do you want to ask a question? Julius, are you asking a question? Okay, so Julius' hand, hand is down. So if there are any further questions, please you can ask uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, the tutor. So at this point, I'm going to end the recording so that I'll begin uploading, uploading it. Until next class, when we discuss causal reasoning, I wish you guys a very happy weekend and um, goodbye. Yeah, Julius, I can see your hand up again. Julius, do you want to ask? Sir, uh, yes. sir please, concerning the IE. Concerning the IE, is it going to be purely objectives or going to be written in objectives? Uh, I don't know anything about the IE because I'm not involved in setting it. Okay, so you, you. Need to, you need to contact the coordinator who is in charge. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome. So I'm ending the recording and then to begin the upload.